evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Here verse 5. The next day the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Copiapus, if I can say it correctly. He was actually the father-in-law of Annas, so this was kind of like a family thing. John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They put Peter and John and brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name do you do this? You see, you have to get our permission. We're the high priest. We're the high council. We're the large and in charge. We're the big wigs. We, you you got to get our permission. you got to come to us first. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we were being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple, and are we asked how he was healed? You see, previously we talked about the guy who was crippled, who was at the gate beautiful, and always was getting alms, was getting the money. And they said, well, we don't have alms, we don't have money, but what I'll give you, but what we do have, we'll give you. Be healed in the name of Jesus. See, this is why they were in trouble. Because they healed somebody, because they did something good in Jesus' name. So he said, then how this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. And other translations say the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under the heaven given to men by which must be saved. And I'll say this again, this last verse again. Salvation is found in no one else. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not John Smith, not John Wimber, not John Edwards, not Jim Lyon, not D.S. Warner. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven to men by which we must be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now see, a lot of people take this last verse and say it's, you know, that it's not tolerant, that it's not, we're excusatory, that we're putting other people, that you're not open-minded. There might be several ways to Jesus, as Joel Olstein said, and got a lot of criticism for, but Jesus is the only way to God. The stone that the builders had rejected has become a capstone or cornerstone. If you can, turn with me back to Psalm 118 in your pew Bibles. It is page 436. But if you want to go back almost completely back from you're going from here to here, 436, let's read Psalm 118. Now this is kind of long. I know I, I, I kind of fooled you. I gave you a few short verses and I added on. Now I added on a whole chapter. I know I fooled you. Bait and switch. And there was just one little one little verse I could show you. The stone that the builders had rejected had become the capstone. But I want to get you the background behind all this. This is why the Sadducees were so sad. Why the Pharisees, the rulers and the teachers of the law, they were so set up in their rules and regulations. Well, things have to be done this way, a certain way, and it has to be done this way. And Jesus didn't do it the way we expected him to do. Yeah, we were waiting for a Messiah. Yeah, we were waiting for someone to, to get us out of Roman rule to destroy them. But we wanted him to be mean. We wanted him to be large and in charge. We wanted him to have an army and get rid of these Romans and kill them, not love them. So let's start at Psalm 18. Some of this will sound familiar. Verse 1, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron, this was Moses' brother, so he was a, a good speaker when Moses stuttered a lot. So this is why Aaron had a, a, a place in leadership. His love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, 
His love endures forever. You can say it with me. His love endures forever. In anguish I cried to the Lord, for he answered my setting, he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Heard that verse before? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes, people in authority that have been placed over me. They've been given authority by God. They are not God, but God is God. All the nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord, I will cut them off. They surround me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I will cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will cut them off. I will push back and about to fall, but the Lord help me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Yes, the Lord will discipline us, but he will not give up on us. I will not die but live and proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, like we were just talking about, the beautiful gate through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. Verse 22, say this with me. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and all right. O oh Lord, save us. O oh Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. We brought us in his hand and joined the festival of procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. And everybody say this last verse 29 with me. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. You see, they took this verse, Peter and John, that he is the capstone, that he is the foundation. Now, has anybody done any farming work or built a fence? Has anybody built a fence or a stone fence before? Okay, that, oh, all right, skip, skip did. So we have that capstone, right? And that, that holds everything together, correct? If you lose that, other things can fall away. That's what Jesus is, the cornerstone, the foundation, the capstone. In the, in the translation of the English standard translation, in verse 12, it says, no other name. This refers to the exclusive or the salvation by which Jesus Christ, there are only two religious paths, the broad way of the salvation, no, no the broad way that leads to death, or the thin, small road that leads to salvation. And salvation leads to eternal life, where this broad road leads to death, and narrow is the way of Jesus, leading to the path of eternal life. But sadly, the Sanhedrin and the followers of the law were not on that path. They were on the first path. They wanted the rules. If we keep the rules, then we are faith is in the rules, not in Jesus. Today, brothers and sisters, our faith needs to be in Jesus. Not our rules and regulations, but the concepts of Christ. Not tradition. Tradition in and out of itself is not necessarily bad. But when you follow tradition and you think that's it, that's what will save us. Tradition will not save you. Only Jesus Christ. He alone is the capstone. He alone is our cornerstone. He alone is our foundation. The next day, the council of Jewish and religious leaders, civic elders, met to decide what to do with Peter and John. These Sadducees 
may have been the official rulers over Jewish affairs, but they were in a minority party. They could not govern only through the Sanhedrin or the council. They didn't have a Supreme Court or a Senate like we do. Though the Sadducees made up the majority of the council, Josephus tells us that they often had to defer to parasitic opinion. They had to get other people's opinions, so that it wasn't all their way. That's because the Sadducees were disliked by the common people, because they were hoity-toity, right? They were high up. Why the Pharisees were held in high regard. The Sanhedrin was composed of three groups of people. The first, they were the rulers, the high priests. Second were the elders, men of high community standing. The third group was composed of teachers of the law, maybe preachers, maybe uh, seminary professors. It, the Sanhedrin had 71 members and included the high priest and 70 other influential members of the Jewish religious community. You see, they didn't have the separation of church and state like we do. The Sanhedrin had jurisdiction in cases involving matters relevant to Jewish affairs. They didn't extend over to the Roman rule. The Romans just let them do what they kind of did as long as they didn't get out of our rules, as long as they don't affect us, as long as we can still collect the taxes and we're still large and in charge. Where capital punishment was administered by the Roman rule, the Sanhedrin had to receive the permission from the Roman council or the Roman creator. <coughs> Luke makes the point in his gospel that the Sadd Sadducees element that was about to condemn the apostles was heavily represented in the Sanhedrin. The early opponents to the gospel message came mainly from the priests and his immediate helpers. Ananias the high priest was there as well as Cephas, John, and Alexander, the people of his family. Ananias was the high priest for nine years. He continued to have great influence over many years after his years in office. He, was, he still had a kind of a puppet council, kind of like how Putin has always been in charge in Russia, and he always had somebody else in charge, but it was a puppet leader. The New Testament writers show him to be the real power behind the scenes. Sophias was the son-in-law of Ananias, like I said he was before. He was high priest, and he was high priest, his father-in-law, for 18 years. And he had the title of high priest when the events <coughs> happened before with Jesus and the resurrection. But Ananias was such influence and seemed to be making the important decisions. As people are interested in political power sometimes today, it is not strange that the Sanhedrin members ask Peter and John, by what power or what name do you do this? Do you know why they do this? Do you know why lawyers ask you questions I already know? Because they want to catch you in a lie. They want to catch you in a lie, then they don't have to go much further. The apostles are faced with the same issue as Jesus had been. They asked Jesus, do you say you're Lord? Do you say you're king of the Jews? Jesus had also been teaching in the temple when he was confronted by the same general group of chief, chief priests and teachers of the law. They had asked Jesus, tell us by what authority you do these things. Now, four months later, the priests and the teachers are faced with the Jesus question again. All over again, even though the ringleader had been killed. The Sanhedrin is not too pleased with the apostles. They're pretty upset with them. They're disturbing all their peace. On what grounds do you punish Peter and John? On what grounds do you teach? They can't accuse the apostles of of faking a healing, although they wanted to. The evidence of the lame man jumping and leaping was self-evident right before them. But they wanted to know you didn't keep this rule right, right? You didn't do it the way we said you should do it. Not on the Sabbath. Not on the day of rest. But why is it bad to heal somebody even on the day of rest? Perhaps the apostles have an unlawful agenda in mind, they think. Perhaps they are healing through the power of the devil because they're not doing it through us. They're doing it through Beelzebub. They're doing it through Satan. This is what Jesus was accused of himself doing in Luke 11. Thus the Sanhedrin's question is, by what power did you do this? There is an irony here in the apostles' arrest. Peter and John are arrested for teaching about Jesus' resurrection, but they are questioned about healing. 
The Sanhedrin did not want to discuss the resurrection of Jesus, partly because Pharisees, a significant minority to the Sanhedrin, and they believed in the resurrection. So they didn't want to give the Pharisees the rule, just like Republicans won't want to give Democrats any room to talk about their issues. Although they did not believe that Jesus had been resurrected, they could not disprove it. So they didn't want to give them any room. Too many strange events surrounding Jesus' life and death, that he was resurrected and his body disappeared. They accused of his followers of stealing his body and burying it somewhere else because they had to prove that they had won, that they had actually risen from the dead, including this empty tomb. They wanted to show that Jesus had been resurrected and they had to squash out, the Sanhedrin had to squash out this rumor. It's particularly striking that neither on or this or any other occasion did the authorities take any serious action to disprove the, apo the apostles' central message. The resurrection of Jesus, had it seemed possible to refute on this point, how eagerly would the opportunity have been seized? The body of Jesus had vanished so completely that all the resources of the command could not produce it. So they had to prove it a different way. The disappearance of his body, to be sure, was far more proven than his resurrection. But the, but the production of his body would have effectively disproved it. So they couldn't prove it, so they had to stamp it out a different way. Healed by the name of Jesus, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, answers Sanhedrin's questions and accusations by saving the council and asking them about the glorified Christ. This recalls Jesus saying that when they were brought before kings and governors, he will give them wisdom. None of their adversaries can say anything against them. So I say that to you today, when you're in the marketplace, when you're at work, when you're at some place and someone disproves of your Christian message, of your Christian life, you will wonder, what do I say? But God will give you the answer in that occasion. That's why you seek the Holy Spirit. That's why you seek reading daily Bible scriptures and having devotions and praying to God. Even if it's not when your eyes are closed and you're driving down the road, that's when I do it. Because it comes to me. And I better not close my eyes and drive. Sarah already complains about my driving enough. Peter denies that he and John performed magic or that they were involved with evil spirits or the devil. That it was a hoax. That it was a magic trick. That this man was not truly named or healed in the name of Jesus. But Peter pulls no punches and he accuses the leaders of being responsible for Jesus' death. He gained insight, and he insists that Jesus has been resurrected, and through his power, that the lame beggar has been healed. In short, Peter's speech became another declaration of Jesus' Messiahship, that the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. So you have the answer in your hands, and you let it go, because it wasn't the way you wanted it. It wasn't the right restaurant to go to. It wasn't the right way to drive down the road. You see, we get really particular. We get used to having our way, our way. We have to go where we have to go at a certain time, and we are not very flexible. You see, people haven't changed that much in 2,000 years. In 2,000 years, human nature is still the same. They wanted the Messiah to come, but it had to be their way the way they looked at it, from their point of view, from their side of the aisle. We have to not be this way, folks, beloved. We have to look at things differently. Yes, we keep the truth of the Bible. We are Bible people. The Bible is our foundation because Jesus is the word of God coming out of his mouth. It is the salvation. Yes, we keep the Bible, it's our foundation. But we are not so rigid that we can't move or shake. The Bible itself says we all work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And we all fall down. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
And we're supposed to be given grace and forgiveness to everybody else. Why? Because we'll need it. I may not need it right now, but next week I will need it. But we don't find salvation under any other name. The only name is Jesus. Let me read it to you in the ESV translation. On the next day, the rulers and the elders, the scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Ananias and Annas, Cassiphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers, rulers of the people and the elders, if you are being examined today concerning a good deed done to this crippled man, by what means has this man been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that the rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So let's seek Jesus together, brothers and sisters. Let's seek Jesus, and everything else will be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's not keep all these rules of regulations like the Sanhedrin was trying to keep. Jesus is what we are here for, and out of life, of him and everything else comes out of that he is the word of God if you go back and like we read Psalms today it was the foundation Peter and John used Psalms to prove their point the very same text that they were saying that this was about and why they kept all these rules no Jesus was foretold about and he said he is the one and only that they'll try to say under other names and because of him, because they'll try to get their way. But it's not about their way. It's not about your way. It's not about my way. It's about Yahweh, the Lord of heaven and earth, Jesus. He is the stone that the builders rejected and no other name under heaven shall we be saved. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for your understanding with us. Help us to live under your name. No other name in heaven shall we be saved. No other church title, no other church singer, no other school, but only under the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the capstone, the cornerstone. He is our Lord, he is our salvation. Thank you. Thank you for coming and dying on the cross for us. Help us not to get distracted or see other things on the way and think, yeah, maybe we should do it that way. Let us keep your word and your love in our lives. Be the solid rock on which we stand. In your name, I do pray. Amen? Amen. Amen.